Kevin Bowen here. Don't forget to listen to The Fan now on 93.5 or 107.5 FM. And check out our latest coverage online at 1075thefan.com. Super Bowl week is here. Another edition of Kevin's Corner. Kevin Bowen, Chris Presley decked out in his Penn State gear. Refresh my memory, your mother affiliated with the university, correct? My mother's an alum, that's correct. There we go. The Nittany Lions, great game day environment. Uh, speaking of environment, we will give a pick for the Super Bowl to close out things on this edition to Kevin's Corner. Uh, but definitely going to hit big time on Gus Bradley today. The defensive coordinator hire, we'll hear from him. We're taping this late Tuesday morning. We'll hear from him Wednesday in uh, just kind of a group media session. But I've got some insight. Talked to someone that has been on the same staff recently with Gus Bradley. Um, so I'm excited to kind of share those thoughts and get a little bit of intel into that and then Twitter questions as well. Kind of upcoming pods I'm thinking about, Chris. Uh, we'll still get into the quarterback options. Mm-hmm. For the Colts, uh, I've said this before, I think they will try and move heaven and earth to have Carson Wentz not be the starter in 2022. We'll see how successful they are in doing that. We'll break down some of that. You know, we're only about a month and a week away from free agency right. starting, so I do want to hit on that as well. How you doing, man? Doing well. Can't complain. Good week. Did you watch the Pro Bowl? I tried to. How bad was it? I, I didn't watch Oon play. I watched until after Darius Leonard's interception for a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I tried to watch the next possession, and once they got to pretty much two-hand touch, actually it was that that way the entire game. Um, watched our starters on the field, and I was like, all right. I don't even know if it was two-hand touch, the few highlights I saw. <laughs> it might have just have been one-hand touch. It, it it was nuts. That's I mean, an embarrassment to playgrounds across America. The skills competitions are great. Yeah, I do love that. Love the skills competitions. Love, love the way that they show what they can do um, from a physical standpoint. And I understand they don't want to get hurt. Yeah, sure, certainly. I'm not acting like they need to go full bore and, you know, let's play overtime here. But, but like, I did, I did start to ramp back up once I saw that, like, Micah Parsons was actually hitting people. <laughs> And there were some people out there that wanted to play and wanted to, you know, kind of, kind of click the pads a little bit. But it's always the young guys, yeah. you know, it's always the young guys that kind of ramp it up. Yeah, the veterans are like, "Hey, young pup, a this little is, bit more." Yeah, this isn't what we're gonna do. So. Yeah. Well, the AFC won, so you know maybe the Colts can throw that banner up inside of Lucas Oil. Most Pro Bowlers and AFC won the game. I don't it's got to be the easiest over in yeah, betting I know. Yeah. ever. Yeah, <laughs> always, always the easy over there with the Pro Bowl. Um, all right, let's get into Gus Bradley. Yep. Um, you know, hired here as a defensive coordinator certainly will bring a ton of experience. I mean, we're talking about a decade-long run of being a coordinator in the NFL, and that doesn't include his stint as the Jacksonville head coach. We had Mike DiRocco, um, who is basically the ESPN cover of the Jags on our morning show today. So if you're looking for that podcast, you can check it out, Kevin and Query Morning Show. Uh, but he's basically the Mike Wells, covers the Jags, so some insight there. Uh, let's just start kind of overall. I guess let's start with um, the fellow coach that I was going back and forth with yesterday about Gus Bradley, who he is as a person, you know, what to expect from this defense, uh, things like that. Uh, so this was, I guess let's start with him as a human more mm-hmm. than just kind of the scheme, Chris. Um, and I'll just run down some quotes here uh, via our, our conversation, and then we can expand on it here in just a second. But a great coach, better person. Players gravitate to his personality. He feels like the players enjoy kind of a simpler scheme that's easier to max out potential. Um, he was saying that Gus Bradley's defenses are pretty much the same about 80% of the time. It's kind of a cover three Um, defense you're not going to get a center field safety I think at times we feel like Julian Blackman has kind of been a center fielder here Uh, basically he was saying they're going to cheat one safety to one side of the field so maybe it's a 60 40 or something like that there when they aren't in cover three there's a little bit of cover four Um, I asked him you know how much man how much press the answer was quick none 
on that. So I don't think you're going to get a lot of you know press coverage or a lot of you know cover zero or cover one looks out of Gus Bradley here. Um, really harp the fact of he wants to generate pressure with the four man rush. I, if I'm not mistaken, last year I think. The Raiders were last in the NFL in blitz percentage. I think I saw that going around. So minimal blitz, doesn't want to blitz a lot. And he kind of just summarized it as, won't be a dominant unit, bend but don't break, all about eliminating the big play. So those were um, the takeaways there. Again, as a person, a little bit schematically. Um, I guess general thoughts, Chris, when you hear, some of those comments, I know I kind of threw a lot at you. No, that's, I mean, I'm going to wait to see what happens, but that sounds a lot like Matt Eberflus. Yeah. Um, it helps that he had Max Crosby, obviously, so you don't necessarily have to blitz when you got a guy like that coming off the end. Sure. Yannick and Gakwai opposite as well. But. It does sound a lot Eberflus-like, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, I um, what I like about Bradley, a couple things. First off, there's a lot of experience in different stops. You know, his start as a coordinator in the NFL, he handled a lot of ego in that Seattle Legion of Boom. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think you like that aspect to it. If you look at, you know, the Chargers to the Raiders, you know, you see a guy like Casey Hayward go from the Chargers to the Raiders as a corner last year. I do think there is an affinity of guys wanting to play for him. Um, Now, that's a fine line, Chris. We've talked about it before, about like, you know, How much are you buddy-buddy? Does that kind of cloud the accountability that you potentially have? Um, The pro of it is, you know, I think if you get to free agency, and honestly, I think Casey Hayward is a free agent, but I'm sure there are some other names we can get into over the next month or so, Chris. But, like, I do think if you're a free agent, you're Chris Presley, and you're looking to cash in, and you've got two teams neck and neck, and you hear Gus Bradley's the D coordinator and, you know, whoever's the D coordinator in a different town – and you start texting your buddies around the league, it seems like Gus Bradley will give a pretty favorable response. So that could push you, you know, over the edge, and that could be an advantage for the Colts, certainly. So I think those are the things that you like. You know, cover three, I, I've always been intrigued by it. Um, It's something different. You know, I know Eberflus, I think sometimes everyone's just like, oh, he only played cover two, he only plays Tampa two. That was a bit false. You know, I think there were more zone looks yeah. than people gave him credit for. But the press, the man, you know, selfishly I would like to see a little bit more of that because, Chris, I think when you're so reliant on a four-man rush, it's just hard to disrupt timing on a consistent basis. And let's be honest, you brought up Max Crosby. So he had Max Crosby and Yannick Ngakwe with the Raiders, proven Pro Bowl pass rushers. The previous stop is the Chargers. Well, Joey Bosa and Melvin Ingram, proven Pro Bowl rushers. Like, you don't have that here. You, you got Buckner, but you're going to have to develop. So it all comes back to the podcast we did last week about what needs to be seen in this hire. And I don't know if this falls strictly on Gus Bradley's shoulders or if it falls on the defensive line coach to be hired, but you got to develop. Yeah. You have to develop. Quiddy Pay, whether you bring back Kamoko Ture, you know, Dio Dengbo is probably more of an interior rusher. But, like, when we talk about the 2022 season, and obviously we haven't done a lot of it yet, and we will get into that over the next few months or whatnot, what can take the Colts from 9-8 and eight to playing in deep January? One of the biggest internal questions is if you can develop some of these young rushers, and a Dangbo and Pay probably fall at the top of that list. Mm-hmm. If you can do that, Chris, that can all of a sudden mean – you've jumped from, you know, one part of the sidewalk all the way across the street. Uh, That, to me, I think is just a huge element to this hire um, here. Um, So Bradley, again, been in Seattle for four years, 29, or 2009, 2012. Then he goes and he's a Jags head coach. Do you think this ends the Jags curse, by the way? Gus Bradley started (laughs) the Jags dominance over the Indiana. I would hope so. I mean, good Lord. Do you believe in that? Are you a, are you voodoo like that? Yeah, I kind of am. You know. I'm, are you really? Yeah, yeah to a okay. degree. I, I probably you know baseball that. superstitions and stuff like that. So don't step on that chalk, man. <laughs> yeah. Um. 
And then he was with the Chargers for four years after that. No overlap with Frank Reich. Remember, Frank Reich was with the Chargers. Yep. And then last year was with John Gruden and the Raiders before all that happened. And, you know, he stayed on, of course. And uh, the Raiders made the playoffs. You know, when I look at some of these league ran- rankings, and I've got this up an article on the website, pretty good uh, total yardage defense allowed, you know, above average um, most years. Decent against the run. Pass defense, I think, has been okay considering the lack of the pass rush. That that kind of stood out to me, Chris. When you look at the pressure rate and the sack percentages with the guys that we've mentioned, mm-hmm. they've kind of been a below average group in that area. Yet they've overcome that and been a decent scoring defense as well. Um, so I I'm pretty mixed reviews on the hire. Um, Any indication on who he might bring? Yeah, I, I think there's been a lot of whispers about that, you know, staff-wise, and you know, certainly there's got turnover in several different spots from defenses over the years. So, um, again, the D line coach and the development is just going to be paramount, right? To me, I just keep on coming back to there's no substantial pass rush pass rush history, Chris, and. That was the biggest prerequisite to me. And, and that's where my concern mm-hmm. kind of falls down. I mean, when we talked about the three things I wanted to see, pass game focus, pass rush focus, uh, the willingness to you know adapt or just dictate a little bit more to your opponent was the other one that I threw in there. You know, I, I don't know if this, this hire doesn't necessarily check those boxes. Um, now maybe we'll get in the season, we'll see some things differently, and maybe, I don't know, he gets here and he sees, boy, I like to four man rush it, but you guys you guys can't get home with that four man rush. I've got to commit some other things. You know, he oftentimes would take a linebacker off the field with the Raiders. They didn't have a lot of great linebackers. But here you're not taking Leonard and yeah. Okereke off the field. So you're gonna see some changes there. Do you see more safeties? You know, I don't I mean the Julian Blackman torn Achilles thing, you know, that's something you've gotta take into consideration, but um I mean, whether it's Max Crosby or Ngakwe or Melvin Ingram, like those dudes would come in here and instantly be your top edge rusher and it wouldn't even be close. So I guess that's where some of um, the concern there is with me. Um, Now, you know, talking to this person about just how much he can relate to players and like the benefit, I found the Denzel Perryman edition they had this year interesting. Perryman was traded late in training camp to the Raiders and became a pro bowler. So think about that, Chris. I mean, you're yeah. traded late in, in training camp. You're missing out on valuable, valuable practice time, and yet you become a pro bowler where, you know, the previous stop, I forget where Perryman was previously, so for some reason Carolina is sticking out. Um, you're able to come in there and, you know, be a relatively high-level player for you. So can he attract anybody? You know, I – it's more of a college football question that right. you kind of have from a recruiting standpoint, but that is um, a question that I have here. Yeah. No, it makes total sense. Right now it's, I mean, NFL is kind of like college. Like you said, it's about recruiting, and if he can bring some guys over. And I wrote this on Monday. You know, has Jim Mersey demanded more free agency attention from Chris Ballard? I would think so. Think and – Hope? When you say push, yeah. Hope, How about hope? hope. Yeah, <laughs> you know? hope, hope I mean, is actually shit. a really good word. And you hope, but you also hope for this, Chris. You don't have a first-round pick. So that avenue to significantly build your roster. Yeah. Um, you know, I found this interesting looking at Cincinnati, looking at L.A., and kind of comparing things to the Colts. You know, when you look at Cincinnati, obviously primarily built heavily offensively through the draft. Tremendous job drafting. I mean, you know, passing on to Panay Sewell and drafting Jamar Chase – it's probably not something that happens with Chris Ballard running the show, but look at what they have done now. If you look at their defense, though, Chris, a lot of free agency attention on that side of the ball, knowing you can't solve everything mm-hmm. through the draft. The Colts' season finale in Jacksonville, Chris, of the 22 starters, not a single one of them came from the spring portion of free agency. And when you think about roster building, and the time to get proven talent. You're going to have to pay right. pretty penny, but to pay proven talent, it's the spring, it's March, it's April. Not one starter for the Colts in that season finale against Jacksonville 
came from that. Like, the core of roster building has to be through the draft. But sometimes you go to the garage sale, Chris, and you and I are in line, and we both <laughs> see, you know, that incredible, you know, picture of the city of Indianapolis or whatever, and, you know, it says $6 on the sticker, and you go, well, I'll go 8 and I'll, well, I'll go 9 There is that aspect of free agency where – you can't just go down the street to CVS and buy that or to yeah. Walgreens and buy that. You've got to be willing to realize the supply and demand that is free agency. And so that's something that, man, I, I would like to see change here. Yeah, and I think I think you speak with a lot of the fandom here. I think yeah. A lot of the fans agree with you. On right, that. right. And it just I've it's just kind of always been a bit of a head scratcher with me with Ballard. I, I, I understand – the homegrown talent and the side of the building guys and, you know, develop your own culture. I totally understand that. And I get without doubt, if you're making a pie chart, you want that to be 70, 80% of your roster. But we'll all watch the game on Sunday night, Chris, and we'll all see a lot of non home homegrown talent. <laughs> non homegrown talent. Yeah. I just felt like I had an out of body experience there <laughs> trying to say what I was trying to say there. Rams, Cincinnati, they both have it. So uh, we'll see. March 16th, maybe? March 18th, something like that. Seems to be ringing a bell in free agency. Um, yeah, will be interesting. Gus Bradley, anything else on that, or should we get into Twitter questions? No, let's go to Twitter questions. Yeah. First one's from Colts Maniac. With Gus Bradley being hired, do you think much will change with our scheme? Also, any idea of what kind of energy he will bring to the team? Thanks for the time. Always enjoy the podcast. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, You know, I get some definite energy, leadership, connecting with player vibes. I, I get more of that than I get. Got with Matt Eberflus, to be honest with you. You think about Gus Bradley, maybe I'm going too back to too too far back to the Seattle days, Chris. But like, there are some Pete Carroll vibes. Like, oh, that's mm-hmm. pretty cool, dude. And I mean, again, a lot of ego in that Seattle defense yeah. to try and corral there. You know, from a philosophical standpoint, it's you know, it's going to be pretty simple. Um, now, the cover three is a little bit different. You know, do you get more safeties on the field? They didn't do a ton of that with the Raiders, but I thought he was open to some dime personnel packages with the Raiders. Granted, he still wants a four-man rush. Well, dime with the Raiders means you aren't taking off a quality linebacker like you would be here in Indy if you are taking off one of those linebackers. So, you know, personnel is going to influence some of that. But, um, you know, coverage-wise, Chris, I don't love the it's going to be 80% of the same thing. But, again, within that cover three, can you have specific little nuances for tight ends? You know, can your front do some things differently with, you know, bootleg action? You know, some of the other stuff we talked about. Yeah. What is your approach within the course of adapting over games of what you do in the fourth quarter versus what you do earlier? You can point to various stats that you really like about Bradley or you really don't like. Um, Again, scoring defense, they were pretty good last year. They also were dead last in the red zone and dead last in – or not dead – they might have been dead last. They were really bad in turnovers. Um. Is turnovers Darius Leonard, you know, or is that scheme, defense, those sorts of things as well? This one comes from Crenson. Obviously feels like Joey Burrow is the reason that the Bengals made it to the Super Bowl, which I think a lot of us can agree with it being a second year. Big fan of Ballard, but he feels like his stubbornness is that he doesn't go after the one guy, and that one guy is constructed in the philosophy is around the quarterback. So do we need to go get a quarterback? Yeah, I mean, this kind of goes back to his opening press conference, Chris, and saying it's not about one guy. Well, it's easier to say when Andrew Luck's your one guy and you're trying to talk to 52 other guys on your roster. Um, You know, I asked him last month, Chris, at that season-ending press conference, have you thought about adjusting your roster-building philosophy? You know, he basically said, I have thought about it. I think he said I thought long about it. And kind of paused. But then the rest of the answer sounded very similar to how he usually talks about roster building. Um, but, I mean, I guess he admitted that he's thought long and hard about it. Like, And I don't think Chris Ballard is this, Chris Presley, but I think when you're in those positions of authority, you can't think you're the smartest person in every room. And what the binder might look like that Chris Ballard presented to Jim Mersey in January 2017 or the binder Frank Reich presented to them in you know, February 2018, the binder has to be adjusted over mm-hmm. your tenure. Um, 
you know, Chris Ballard has so many core philosophies that goes back to his Chicago days. Well, the Chicago days of the NFL are a whole lot different than what the NFL is now today. Right. You know, I mean, first time head coach, you make adjustments. Uh, first time GM, you make adjustments. And that's, I think, what I want to see, you know, tweaked. Um, you know, I've done this for the morning show over the past couple of weeks, but one area that has really stood out to me, Chris, is how much money the Colts have invested into their offensive line. I was looking it up the other day. The Bengals have uh, spent, twenty, I think, the 25th most money on their O-line this year. Rams are 22nd. Colts are 4th in the NFL in how much money they've spent on their O-line. This really stood out to me, Chris. You look at the uh, contracts of the five starting offensive linemen for the Colts this past season. 7.9 million, 7.7, 7.5 6.4, Obviously, Quentin Nelson's due a big pay increase going into the Correct, final year yeah. of his rookie deal coming up. But that was this past year. Those numbers might seem a bit like, okay, what does that really mean, Kevin? Well, here are the Rams, five offensive linemen. 5.6, 5.6, 1.5, 1.1, $900,000. The Bengals. 6.5, So of the 10 offensive linemen in the Super Bowl, Chris, nine of them, nine of the 10 make less money than any of the Colts offensive line starters. Like, we're talking Mark Glowinski right. is making more money than nine of the 10 offensive line starters. Like, And I want to make this very clear. I am not sitting here saying offensive line is not important to a degree or there doesn't need to be some resources invested into it. But there is a balance in what you're committing to that part of the grocery and what you're committing to the other parts of the grocery. You can't take $3 into the meat section and think you're going to cook some incredible filet and, you know, wow, your neighbors that you're coming over. You know, you can take $3 into the chip section, and I can make do. Uh, Got to hope you get a good deal. On so do you think zone. we overcompensated going from a, a team where everyone, yeah. especially locally, said yeah. we need offensive linemen, and then we established two – I wouldn't say too many, but I, – I think there's too it? much invested in the O-line. Okay. And the return on investment hasn't been there. You know, when you're fourth in O-line spending, I don't think the Colts had the fourth best offensive line, you know, this year. And so, um, and again, I know there's people out there going to be like, Kevin, I can find audio from you in 2018 that said the O-line needs to be improved. The O-line needed to be improved, but I just think it went too far. You know, for your fifth offensive lineman, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'd be willing to bet those five cap situations that I just mentioned, they're probably top, I don't know, 12 or 14 on the Colts' entire roster. Like, yeah. And it goes back to the, and I've mentioned this before, Ryan Grigson and Bill Polian, their thought on the interior offensive line was, we can get by. We can get by. Find some scraps. You, you got to get by somewhere. All 22 positions aren't ranked the same. Yeah. You have to get by somewhere. And I know it's a tough bounce. And look, we're going to watch the Super Bowl on Sunday night. And one of the biggest reasons that I think the Rams are going to win the game, even though my heart wants Cincinnati, is, Aaron <laughs> is Von Miller and Aaron Donald yeah. and, and and Leonard Floyd. So offensive line, again, I don't want to act like it's not a, a huge, huge thing that should be kept in mind. But at some point, Chris, you know, you can have two or three guys you've invested in, but, you know, has Ryan Kelly lived up to the center money? Has Mark Lewinsky lived up to that right guard money? Did Eric Fisher live up to the left hand? You know, that's what you get into there. Um, so that kind of comes back, I guess. Crimson, I've kind of gone on a little bit of a rant there. But it is roster construction mm-hmm. to me of just allocating resources. O-line needs some resources, without a doubt. But it's just I think it's gone too far. And it's hard to re, kind of retrace your steps, if you will. Right. We're going to stay with quarterback with a question from Craig. Knows that we don't have enough capital for Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson. Uh, but we do have the best running back, linebacker, offensive guard in the NFL, in his opinion. Do you think Chris Ballard would be willing to give up one of those guys for a top-five quarterback? It's a good question, Craig. Um, you know, Put myself in Ballard's shoes. I'm not sure what his thinking would be. 
Um, now, you also have to keep in mind, Chris, like, you know, how does Green Bay value those guys? Mm-hmm. For example, you know, to me, Green Bay needs some reinforcements at receiver if Devontae Adams is going to go elsewhere. You know, wouldn't Denver make sense? Yeah. You know, they got, I'm looking at your Penn State gear, you know, KJ Hamler, and the, they've got some young wideouts and Nathaniel Hackett connection. Like, you know, again, it all comes back to the two way street. How do other teams view those situations there? Um, you know, one thing I've thought a lot about quarterbacks, and you know, someone kind of sparked my mind down this path. But, Chris, I think it's such a brilliant point to make how the quarterback position is viewed in the NFL by the top offensive minds. Yeah, I think if we were going to rank the coaches you'd call the top offensive minds in the NFL, Sean McVay I think would definitely be, be one of them. Uh, I think probably Andy Reid would fall on that list. Um, I think in somewhere, you know, Kyle Shanahan probably right. falls on that list. And you look at all their situations, Chris. Each of them got to a point where they said, I might think I'm really smart offensively. I might think our scheme is brilliant, our approach. You know, I can out chess match so many coaches week in and week out. But at some point, that dude that touches the ball every single play, he's got to go do stuff that I can't draw up on the whiteboard Monday through Saturday. Yeah. And so for McVay, it was, all right, Jared Goff, we took you one overall, and you got us to a Super Bowl at one point, and – we even won a road playoff game last year when you were on the roster, but we we need something different. We need more. Andy Reid did it with Alex Smith to Patrick Mahomes, and Kyle Shanahan's done it with Trey Lance, you know, and, and Jimmy G with that seemingly being kind of a mutual agreement. So when you think about those offensive minds, again, brilliant, brilliant offensive minds, but yet they were like, hey, even we need more. Mm-hmm. That's where I feel like the Colts are sitting down at this point. And again, I don't think anyone is calling Frank Reich those offensive minds, you know. But still, I think Frank Reich is viewed as a pretty good offensive mind in the NFL, as he should be. Has there been a point of reflection to where you're now looking at Carson Wentz and saying, well, yeah, he's okay, <laughs> like, but we need more. Yeah, you know, I to me, I think that self reflection this off season is needed, and I'm curious if it's happening. I think it's happening at the at the very top with the owner. I think it's happening with Ballard, it's starting to happen with Reich. Mm-hmm. But again, what's the change? Right. Yeah, that's that's the million, million, million. Oh, for sure. Question from Brian: Keeping with the quarterbacks, knows the Colts. Knows that there's a lot of uh, need for quarterbacks in the NFL. Can the Colts trade Carson Wentz to get rid of the cap hit and the lack of talent for the second-round pick? Then could they package a deal with Philly in their third-round pick and then get a playmaker at wide receiver or tight end and then also go for a quarterback next season in the draft? They could also try and get a draft capital for the next year's draft to have resources to move up. You know, kind of a second-rounder seems a bit desperate, doesn't it? You know, is Carson yeah. Wentz really worth that? Uh, you know, I I get it. It's a bad dra- draft class for quarterbacks by all accounts. It's an awful free agency class. Mm-hmm. Man, you want to gouge your eyes out for <laughs> right. some reason and just start <laughs> scrolling down that list. And I also think this, you know, we're seeing it. Lovey Smith right now. You know, he's getting a third chance to be a head coach. You know, are quarterbacks getting three chances? No. Three chances are a whole lot. No. Um, I mean, Mike Glennon might. <laughs> Right, In but you know, yeah, yeah, I know, but I know what you're saying. <laughs> you know, I mean, the fact that you draft them two overall, then another team trades a first and third rounder, and another team would trade a second rounder, you yeah. know, at some point it's like, all right. Um, the balance, Chris, of this offseason of either going all in on a quarterback replacement or all in on supporting the quarterback position, what, like, where's the balance? I think that is such a fascinating debate that the Colts need to have, that we're going to have on this podcast. Like, what do you do? Because, I, I mean, we get questions a lot, and I I, I listen to you. Yeah. I listen to you. Do you keep Wentz, and do you say, all right, $40 million free agency. A chunk of that's going to a wideout. A chunk of that's going to an edge rusher. Now you come back in the draft. All right, left tackle here in the second round. All right, tight end here in the third round. But, you know, you don't have a lot of resources to take care of all the needs. So is that the route you go? Or do you say, screw it? 
second rounder and the next two first rounders are going for a quarterback, and you'll figure it out how to support that quarterback. Yeah. Stick with the quarterback again with a question from Sam. Wants to know your opinion between Wentz and Garoppolo. He feels like Garoppolo has a better pocket presence. Wentz looked very flustered in an untrusting O-line, which we already touched on earlier in the podcast at the end of the year, and seemed to let that dictate how he played, especially with his footwork. What are your thoughts on that? And loves your work as always. I appreciate that, Sam. Um, curious, Chris, what are your thoughts on Jimmy G? No. Oh, that was quick. My brother's a 49ers fan, watches every game. Even, that was a quick no. Even during the playoffs, he was he said Jimmy G sucks. Like he felt like that was their their big downfall. Now I don't necessarily think he sucks, but yeah. when people start making references and all the memes and all the jokes on Twitter are Jimmy G just pulled a Carson Wentz. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what are you really trading? Yeah. And, you know, if you're a single male in Indy, you don't want Jimmy G no. in your city either. You do not want the hell if you're a married man. You probably don't want him in here either. Um, it really sounds like he's gone, right? Like, mutually, they've kind of agreed yeah, to. Yeah, like, shake hands. Yeah, we're going to part ways. Okay, so Jimmy G. First off, he's making a whole lot of money next year. And you're going to have to give up some draft pick for him. And then are you going to eat the Wentz stuff? You know, there's going to be some cap implications. I mean, that's a lot to give up for. I think it's true lateral. When we talked about it last week, he had Kittle and Debo. We don't right. have those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So no, that's a great point. Again, I I don't know if I said this on last week's pod, Chris, but, like, I would rather have Carson Wentz and Jimmy Garoppolo. And some people are going to be like, what? And, again, I think a lot of it is, who are you a fan of? Like, Jake was talking about it earlier today. He's like, yeah, I, I know some Raiders fans that are fed up with Derek Carr. It's like when you watch the quarterback play 17 times over the season – you just see the war, you know, you mm-hmm. just, you want something different. You want a new voice, new name, whatever. Um, you know, I don't really know why I want to break up with this girlfriend, but the other girl is just somebody different. So, you know, right. here I am. <laughs> um, Garoppolo is so even keel and so like, I feel like they get to the end result, Wentz and Garoppolo, but Wentz has more ebbs and flows. Well, I'd rather have Wentz because in the playoffs he might be hot for two games, and that that might be the difference. I don't. I've never seen Garoppolo get hot. I, no. Like I know what that looks like. Um, certainly not in the playoffs. Right. And like you said, Debo and Kittle aren't here. I mean, I guess he's getting Jonathan Taylor. And the other thing that worries me is injuries. And the ACL in 2018, the ankle injury true. I didn't think two about that. years ago. You know, you worry about availability with him as well. Yeah. All right, we're going to go to a question from Paul. I've been thinking about your interview with Kurt Warner regarding the processing of the quarterbacks on the field. In his far less than Hall of Fame experience, he had a hard time processing the floor um, of what his coach wanted when he played basketball. Oh, so Paul's talking basketball. Here. Paul's going basketball here. Cut. It wasn't until he got to college and playing in intramural teams that the processing of what was going on caught up to him with a meager physical ability. I truly think that the offseason repetition in the plays and mental repetition on the field will help him. Also, I think that Reich will likely sit him down and Carson over the offseason to retrain his eyes and how he should, should simply view things. On a side note, one of Reich's compliments of our backfield what, or what was our backup quarterback was that he simplifies the game very well. Curious of what your thoughts are moving forward on that matter. Thanks for all the time you put in on the Colts coverage. Well, thank you, Paul, for that question. Um Let's let's save the Ellinger stuff for a little bit later. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Ellinger finds simple better, and I don't think Wentz does a great job of that. That's totally fair. Um, okay, hey, Paul. I the comparing Carson Wentz's eyes to intramural basketball was <laughs> whew, man. That was. Uh, you think Paul's got a good jump shot? Probably. Yeah. Uh- you know, if you're from Indiana, if you can't shoot in- the basketball, you shouldn't have a driver's license from this state. I was going to say, if he's from Indiana especially, he's got a good jumper. You should, I mean, if you were, if you were born here, you you got to hit 7 to 10, 8 to 10 free throws. Mm-hmm. And if you shoot a three-pointer in an NBA game, you got to be able to hit it. Yeah. Point blank. Um, <laughs> Paul, that gave me good laugh. <laughs> yeah, Carson went seven years in the NFL. I, in all seriousness, Chris, there's no position in sports that is more different from practice than a game, than quarterback. Like, you literally wear a different color jersey yeah. in practice. They, they, you can't get hit in practice. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, I think, is where you get into the, um, 
the retraining and all of that. You know, is Frank Reich pitching this to Chris Ballard? You know, is he saying, hey, guys, trust me, you know, let me sit down with them. Sure, but um, at some point you're seven years into this league and you, know, you guys have heard me say it often, the scar tissue. You know, has that just gotten Carson to a point where it's hard to repair that? Yeah. And as much as your offensive line can be better than what you had in Philly, it's still just that you don't trust it like you used to trust it. Um, I think we've all have we all can compare to that in some way, just with like physical ailments. You know, whether you have your respective injuries or whatnot, um, when do you trust your body? When do you trust anything in life? Um, I, I think that's something everyone can compare themselves to outside of the intramural basketball to. <laughs> Uh, NFL quarterback there. I miss playing pickup basketball, though. I'm a very mediocre basketball player. Very mediocre. I mean, you're tall. What are you, power forward? Well, Small uh, forward? I'd like to think stretch four. Okay. Yeah, stretch four. Notre Dame had a guy a few years ago named Tim Abermitis. Yep. That's kind of who I like to pattern my game after. <laughs> kind of draw, you know, draw somebody away from the basket. No vertical. Yeah. Very slow post moves. I can occasionally get somebody on that sleeping. Um, but I don't get a lot of invites to play basketball. Yeah, I'm, I'm more of a pit snoggle. Oh, my God, I love it. What's he doing? Big guy. That, he's a he's a PE teacher Is in he? middle school, yeah. Gosh, they showed it. They, had it. they interviewed him and his wife one year uh, at a West Virginia game on the sideline. God, I loved him. Yeah, Mike th- Gansey with a T-shirt. Yeah, I'm a 3-3 three to three guy, but... You know, I, j- I just do fundamental set ball screens, all that stuff. Did but Pitt Snoggle ever do anything in the NBA? I don't think. I don't even know if he made the NBA, did he? God, that West Virginia team was fun <laughs> to watch. Question from Sam. Do you think the lack of the premier talent at running back, wide receiver, and tight end last year kept some quarterbacks from wanting to come here? Jonathan Taylor and Michael Pittman Jr. were rather than unproven going into last season, and we had no clear number two wide receiver or a tight end. You know, I, Sam, it's a fair point, but I don't really think, like, I don't think Matthew Stafford and Tom Brady were really, like, you know, that's the reason why I don't want to go to Indy. And I don't even I don't even know if it ever came to that. You know, I, don't, I think there was probably other reasons why they were more attracted to the different spots. Now, certainly Mike Evans and Cooper Cup and mm-hmm. Robert Woods, I guess, healthy at the time. You know, that would be um, something to, to point out. But I do think overall Sam's point is good, is strong of like you know, we talked about earlier, Gus Bradley might might, you know, cause a defensive player to want to come here. Well, offensively, the talent you have, I, I don't know if that's gonna be the same here. Right. So I do think it's a good point. I don't know how much of it directly related to ending up with Wentz. Yeah. All right, we got four more here. This one's from Adam. Carson has a total cap hit of twenty eight plus million next year, currently tenth highest. In the quarterback, should Chris Ballard make Man, the ultimatum? That's high. Yeah, you say tenth highest. Yeah, tenth highest. Should Chris Ballard make the ultimatum for Carson to restructure his contract to eighteen million dollar pay cut, but promise him to sign a top flight wide receiver in free agency, and promise that Wentz will likely be the starter for po- if he gets positive touchdowns to interception ratio, or if Carson Wentz wants to keep his money, he would either be traded for a bottom tier team for peanuts and flat out. What are your thoughts there? His example was looking at pretty much like last chance you for Carson Wentz coming up. Oh, last chance you. That was a great, great uh, show. Yeah, it is. You watch that? I did. Yeah. My wife and I really enjoyed that. That was wild. Um. Okay, Adam, this is a pretty creative idea, the restructure idea. Mm-hmm. You know, I am a big believer in return on investment means something. You know, I go back to the offensive line breakdown we had earlier with the money there. You know, Carson Wentz, 10th highest paid QB. Boy, that's, Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not getting the return there that I need. So the restructure is interesting to me. Now, having said that, I still am of the believer that, like, Carson Wentz making 10 million next year, I'm just throwing out a number, it doesn't make me sleep any better about the quarterback position. Sure, it might help me out somewhere else, but it's, I still got the same dude. And, like, touchdown to INT ratio, like, that's a stat. But, you know, I've also said this. Like, touchdowns can be weird. You know, didn't Carson throw a touchdown on, like, that little flip to Naeem Hines? Right. Like, touchdowns to me is not a great passing statistic. It can get a little skewed. You get there on the goal line and, 
Well, Jonathan Taylor got stuffed on first and goal from the one. All right, so now we're going to dump it to Jack Doyle in the flat, and he's going to catch a touchdown, where easily it could have been Taylor's touchdown. Or Taylor ran 75 yards on a play and gets tackled to the two, and then you throw it the very next play. And vice versa, again, with running touchdowns as yeah. well. Um, the stats that I really like, I, I really like yards per attempt. Um I think completion percentage means something. I think it can show consistency consistency and efficiency. But I think yards per attempt, you know, kind of looking at that as well also helps out. But, yeah, Adam, if you're going to keep Wentz, I would hope some sort of restructure would be in the cards. This one comes from Zach. Kevin, recently there's been a lot of speculation about possible quarterback scenarios. Is there any chance to pursue Deshaun Watson? He potentially has the highest upside of all the options on the table. Would assume his asking price has gone down since nobody has been willing to pay him with his legal issues. Yeah, I'll be honest, Zach. I haven't followed the case too closely. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think I saw there's like a deposition coming up shortly. Have you? Seen I've that? not really followed it much either. I feel like it's kind of waned off the the national media radar, which is mostly what I pay attention to. Right. Um, I think there's something coming up here in the month of February, and like if you're the Watson camp. And the Texans camp, you probably want something legally to try to be resolved. Again, I have no idea if it's possible. You want it to be resolved before the new league year begins because you want you know, the teams to plan for a trade or certainly before the draft, but I think before the new league year. Mm-hmm. You know, I like I know that the Colts are open to, and again, this is not in the same camp, but like when you talk about what worries teams with red flags and whatnot, like the Colts are very open to, if you got busted for weed in college, you're not coming off the Colts draft board. <laughs> like, sure, they want to do a little background on it. They're want to going to find out some more information, but it's not like, you smoked pot. You can't be drafted by the Colts. And, again, I know the Watson thing is a lot different. Um, With three daughters and two of them heavily involved, or say wise I can't see them entertaining much of the Watson thing, Chris. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a good point. Strictly my opinion on it. Not to mention you still would be having to trade for a quarterback within your own division. Like, <laughs> I think the trade package would go through the roof there. So um, I'm going to say no on that front, Zach. Fun one here from uh, Wake Spike. Uh, well, the first part is second, or the second part is, I should say. The first part, do you think the locker room has lost faith in Carson Wentz and how much his ability to play, or how much will that play into the decision to take the dead cap hit? Do you think the locker room has lost faith in Wentz? Um, I do worry about this. You know, when you get back into those moments, Chris, late November, early December next year, you're down. You need your quarterback to lead a drive. Chris, it's human nature. Mm -hmm. How do you not think back to, you know, what is on your resume? What's on your track record? I would say the confidence of the Bucs walking into a huddle with Tom Brady is a little bit different than the Colts walking into one with Carson Wentz. Mm -hmm. Might be an unfair comparison by me, but whatever. That's just what popped into my head. Um, So, yeah, I I do think that is, you know, when you heard about Jacoby Brissett after that 2019 season, bless you, by the way. Thank you. Leadership was often mentioned with Jacoby. You know, often meant I, I don't hear that with Wentz. I'm not acting like he's a bad leader, but I just think not, again, to the level that the Colts expect out of their players, specifically their quarterback. And some of this, you know, I almost feel bad for Carson in that, like, I just think what happened in Philly, natural human instinct, you can't rid that out of your mind. Right. You can't. You can't get that. And who knows? It was a lot of he say, she say stuff in Philly, and but – you know, if you're friends with somebody on that Eagles team and they're texting you and you're Naeem Hines, you're going to be like, dude, I'm sorry, man. This is kind of what we saw happen to us. Well, even when you watch the mic'd up, when you have, like, the defense on the sideline and they're like, let's go whatever quarterback's out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not only your side of the ball. It's the faith of the other guys. Right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, confidence certainly spans that entire locker room. So, uh, might be unfair of me, but I think that's a fair question. Well, the second question is a little more lighter. What are your top three dips as we head into Super Bowl season? Dips. Chip. Chip. Chip dips. Oh, yep. my God. <laughs> Can we go for an hour? <laughs> You're a big dip guy, huh? Dude, literally, if you gave me, first off, I don't need any dips. You just give me a bag of nacho cheese Doritos and Maddie's <laughs> out of town. I can eat the whole bag in probably 13 minutes. I, know, I do know that's your favorite chip. 
Now my fingers would be stained for a month. <laughs> but I am obsessed. You know, I have dabbled lately into going to a little cool ranch occasionally. Yeah. It's a nice little curveball. Nice little change up. See, most people would say that's their favorite drink. Really? I wow. think it's I think it's a toss up between that's, nacho that's cheese. That's blasphemy to me. Cool ranch has over nacho cheese, really. I, I guess think, your fingers are in better shape. I think it was always like a spe- you know, in the in the package, it was always those were always like the most traded at the lunch. Yeah, table. oh yeah. Trust me, I try to execute some wild trades back in the day to get more <laughs> into my possession. All right, dips. I mean, can we get some buff chick dip going? Boom. For, that was my number one. Bowl. I mean Yep. I need it. I need it now. I really hope Maddie's ready to eat a whole lot on Sunday. <laughs> um love queso. Mm-hmm. Just gen- I mean, just generic queso. I can go with guac certainly, but if I'm right, re- honestly, it'd be in that order: buffalo okay. chicken dip, queso. I like a good little like taco dip action there. That's what. So mine were buff chick, sour cream and onion with ruffle lays, Ooh. and then the seven layer taco dip. Yeah, I'm gonna buff. Okay, I'm I, I'm I'm switching my list. I'm making a change here. Time out. Um, Buff chick, taco, seven layer. This sounds immaculate. And I guess queso is kind of similar, but still, I'll put queso over guac. Okay. Sour cream is good, yeah. I am literally I'm foaming <laughs> right now at the mouth. How many questions do we have left? One I, more. This one's from RC. I'm just, I think I'm heading to Qdoba right as we speak. <laughs> so he's a firm believer that Frank Reich as a coach, or in Frank Reich as a coach, but do you think his abil- what do you think of his ability to evaluate quarterbacks is slightly overrated? He once said that there's a lot of confidence behind Jacoby Brissett as a top 15 quarterback. Carson Wentz continues to miss wide open receivers, and he's dealt with major accuracy issues all season. Or is RC just over evaluating that? You know, I I know Frank Reich's words are his words. My you know issue has always been Chris. When does that creep into your actions? Now they didn't keep Brissett after that 2019 season, so mm-hmm. it's not like. They committed to him long term. If he, if you thought he was a top twenty QB and he was that young and you'd only had a one year with him, you would have tried to develop him even more. Um, I mean, let's be honest. Andrew Luck and Philip Rivers reached some heights here with the Colts under Frank Reich that they hadn't reached in Luck's case previously. Uh, Rivers' case in in quite some time. Um, so I, I still think Frank knows what he's doing with quarterback. Again, I, the Wentz thing to me, it's just a lot of stuff happened since Carson Wentz and Frank Reich were together. I think yeah. that was the kind of the worry for me, and that is more relationship-based. Um, you know, if I'm in that building, and this comes back to the balance, Chris, of all-in on quarterback or all-in on supporting the quarterback this offseason, the all-in on quarterback, the intrigue of that would be one of Frank Reich's greatest strengths is developing QBs. Well, let's get him a guy that has traits you like, whether it was – you know, Malik Willis or Kenny Pickett or Sam Howell or whoever. The Corral kid from Ole Miss is actually someone that I always kind of like. Yeah, um, same. Like. But just fresh clay. Shout out Sibby Hill, my ceramics teacher at Cathedral High School. Fresh clay. Can you mold the clay? I made these salt and pepper shakers in Sibby Hill's class, Chris, that I forgot to put a top with, like, little holes in them. So you ju- we just dump the salt and pepper. It <laughs> flows. I mean, think of it like a Gatorade cap. It's pretty impressive. That's a hard mold. It, it was. Yeah, thank you for that. I think I got a B minus in there. She also <laughs> taught me at Clay Junior High, so I think that was the only reason why she gave me a B minus. But anyways, um, mold, mold, you know, something, you know, something where I can get my hands on it, and I'm going to put that thing in the kin, kiln, kiln, I forget kiln. what it's called, kiln, uh, one day, and I go from there. Yeah. That's. But again, if you go that route, man, it's costing you. Mm-hmm. It's costing you. All right, well, that does it with Twitter questions. Kevin, what are your projections? We talked about dip, Super Bowl coming up this weekend. Who do you have winning and by how much? Yep, yep, yep. Heart is who day nation for sure. Uh, I had the Rams in the Super Bowl. I had them losing to the Bills in the Super Bowl. Um, I've seen Odell Beckham and Von Miller take it to another level. Mm-hmm. Um, sure, more pressure on the Rams. I don't think there's pressure on Cincinnati. You know, you you were told Peyton Manning you're going to get two chances at it his entire career here in Indy. I mean, Joe Burrow, you tell him right now, you're only going to get two chances at it. Like, yeah. there's pressure on Cincinnati, too. 
I will go with the Rams. I think in one square league I'm in, I have a four and a one square. So can Ooh. I go 24-21? Rams is my four square. I was going 24-20 Ooh. Rams. You got so. the Rams as well? That's a little low scoring for my liking, but you know Cincinnati's defense, what they did to Mahomes, like, I don't think we should lose sight of that. Well, so. main part I was guessing that is a four-point spread. Right. We have prop swap, you know, yep. kind of looking at the – the different odds. That is a good point there. Felt like Vegas is not wrong too often, so I'm going to no. kind of keep it between four points. It was kind of growing early, and now it's kind of stayed steady there at four. I think it got up to four and a half yeah. um, at one point there. So hopefully a great game. Um, again, I've got – my heart wants Cincinnati. I've got some financial investment in the Rams, but I'd be pretty, pretty happy with the Cincinnati victory. Yeah, I think I this feel. is – I also think the, the the Rams are a rare big market likable team. I mean Matthew Stafford, I mean, his wife, the cancer story, like right. Sean McVay seems likable. I mean I get Beckham and Ramsey have had some diva moments, but Donald and Cup, Robert Wood seems like a good dude. Like, yeah, I've I've had a, a, a one of my buddies said this is the first year in a while that I've actually just enjoy. I would whoever wins, I'm gonna be happy. Yeah, like just just enjoy watching. Give me, you know. 59, 60-minute drama, Mm -hmm. and I will be a happy camper. Everybody have a great Super Bowl, great week. Enjoy Sunday. We'll be back next week tentatively kind of playing on a look at some of those quarterback options, and uh, we'll do that next week on Kevin's Corner. Talk to you guys then. This has been Kevin Bowen. Thank you for listening to another edition of Kevin's Corner. If you haven't already, subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher for the best Colts and Pacers coverage.